we had originally planned um, for this to be an in-person uh, presentation back in the spring, right, Bert? Um, and um, it was actually one of the first things on the calendar that we needed to cancel uh, in light of closures in the face of the pandemic. Uh, we were sad to have to do that. I just spoke with Professor Vysotsky with my good friend Bert at that time uh, saying, should we do this uh, via Zoom or should we wait? And at that point, we had a little bit of hope and said, maybe we'll be able to do it a few months down the, uh, down the line. So um, we waited. And when it became clear that if we wanted to wait for in-person, we'd have to wait way too long, um, we decided to do it this way. Um, the benefit of this is that there can be so many of you, of us together, and you can be in many places uh, and different participants, or, or I should say contributors uh, to the volumes don't need to travel. Uh, and uh, it's all good. It's all good. And you're in for a treat. Um, the uh, editors of these volumes, as you know, um, are Professor Bert Vysotsky of the Jewish Theological Seminary, uh, my colleague, and Professor Michael Tilley um, of Tübingen University. The event is co-sponsored um, by the library. This is the first of our book talks of this season, uh, and I hope that you received our notice yesterday showing the first half of the year, the many book talks that we have lined up, or I should say book conversations. It is co-sponsored by the Mills Center for Interreligious Dialogue, which is the center that Bert heads here. Uh, and having said all of that, I am going to recede into the background uh, because uh, Professor Vysotsky has a lot of experience um, conducting events like this and has a perfect voice for an MC. Uh, and so I will, um, you know, cede the primary uh, position to you, Bert, um, and I will follow the chat for questions and the like as they come up. So again, everybody, thank you for coming. And Bert, go right ahead. Thank you, Professor Kramer. Um, I'm uh, appreciative that you are willing to sponsor this. And I am very, very, very happy to be here. Uh, I, just for some brief background, um, this book project began when Michael Tilley reached out to me in 2014. Um, now, that seems like a long time ago, and frankly, it was a long time ago, but given that we have three volumes, 30 authors, and a thousand pages, it's taken quite a long time to bring this series to fruition. Um, again, I'm going to say, since he's on the call, my thanks to Daniel Wunsch of Kohlhammer. He's right there, well, I guess in his house as opposed to Kohlhammer. But um, he has been putting up with us for a long time and making sure that these books get to press. I'm able to show you volume three, which is already in print. Um, it's just the way of the world that volume three came out first. And volumes one and two, God willing, will be out by Hanukkah Christmas. Um, although I suppose if I say Hanukkah Christmas, I should say Inshallah. And then we have all three uh, Abrahamic <laughs> religions in one sentence. But um, I, I'm going to start now by saying, and I'll, I'll end by saying it as well. I know that this volume is available for sale on Amazon.com. And so I hope that uh, if you're interested in it, um, you will buy it. And then um, by the end of this year or early in next year, you can have um, all three and have the set, um, which will look very nice on your shelves. And since we are still in the pandemic and we are still locked down, I feel that it is a mitzvah. It is a good thing that we are able to provide such interesting intellectual reading for all of you. Um, these volumes are written for people who really know their stuff. Um, they're not beginning works and they are sophisticated. Uh, we attempted in every chapter of the 30 chapters to get the world's experts writing on their field. So it's, it's a real wonderful feast for the intellect. I also want to say, and I say this with all sincerity, that over the last 
five, six years of working on this project, I not only have come to appreciate the editorial and logistical skills of my colleague, Michael Tilley, but I have come to treasure him as a friend. And that is a just wonderful thing. I think that for me, as a rabbi and scholar, all Torah should uh, lead to loving friendship. Um, and I, I will also say it didn't hurt when I found out that, like me, Michael Tilley was a lover of single malt scotches. So uh, we, we have not just our Jew interest in Judaism in common, but also that most important interest in scotch. Um, on the call today, I've noticed, I think, I haven't yet seen him, although I'm scrolling through whether Robert Chazen has joined us. He, he said he was going to. Um, and if he's on the call, that means that there are 10 of the 30 authors on this call. And that's also a testament to the dedication of the people who wrote for this. Um, in a moment, I'm going to ask Michael some questions and Professor Tilly will get us off to a start. He'll speak for about 15 minutes. And then um, we're going to have some select writers from each of the three categories of the work to speak for two minutes each to tell us what's in their chapter. And then I will close it out. And then by, by that point, I hope you will have indicated your questions in the chat and Professor Kramer will moderate them. So uh, let me begin again by welcoming um, from Germany, Professor Tilly. I wanna say we have people on the call from Israel, from Germany, from France, from England, and from the United States, um, including one from Nashville. So um, that uh, he's, he's wearing a tie, so you'll know he's from Nashville. Uh, but uh, it, it's been an international effort to put together this book. Um, we, we have Jewish and non-Jewish scholars, and I will confess freely that to this day, of the 30 authors, I'm not sure whether some of them are Jewish or Christian, um, because it wasn't important. They're all experts in their field. Um, but I do want to ask, since he first came to me, Professor Tilly, um, I have two questions for you, and I'd like Please. you to, to speak to them. Uh, the first is, you are a German Lutheran minister. Um, how is it that you became an expert in uh, Judentum, in Judaism? And then the second question is, how'd you find me? Why is it that you reached out to me to be your co-editor? So um, Michael, with that, again, my gratitude, take it away. Okay. Um, well, it started when I was assistant professor at Mainz. And uh, I worked with Professor Günther Meyer and with Professor Otto Böscher. And Otto Böscher, he was a New Testament scholar, just deceased this year. Otto Böscher said, well, you write a thesis on the image of prophets in first century Palestine. And I said, yes, professor. And I found out that I had to learn Mishnahic Hebrew and had to learn Aramaic and had to learn Syriac. Oof. So I went to our uh, Jewish studies department and said, hello, I urgently need to learn these languages. And Günther Meyer, um, who was the only professor in this small department said, well, okay. And it turned out that uh, in most of the courses, I was the only student. And he was kind of mixture between a professor and a drill sergeant. And uh, this was very hard, but it was a very effective way to learn these languages. And then he had an opposition. And he asked me, well, Michael, do you want this position? And I said, well, and he said, well, if you say yes, you are in Judaic studies, no more in New Testament, you are Judaic studies and you're doing this, what we in Germany call a Habilitationsschrift. This is second book, very large second book in uh, Jewish studies. Well, and I thought about and uh, having learned these languages, having read a lot of text, and I said, 
yes, that's what I wanted to do. And so it came out that I dug deeper and deeper and deeper. And uh, the hiatus between what I know and what I want to know grows larger and larger in Jewish studies with every book I read. So, and in 1994, Günther Meyer, he presented a volume, Das Judentum, in the series Religionen der Menschheit. Daniel, that's what, what, what we are doing here, but yeah, the predecessor. Um, well, and this uh, book, Das Judentum, was, well, perfect book, but kind of unbalanced. And unbalanced means it had approximately 600 pages and 250 of these 600 pages were an excellent article on Jewish philosophy in the 19, 19, uh, in, in, in the 19th and 20th century. It's written by Professor uh, Trepp, Leo Trepp. Excellent article, but more than uh, nearly nearly half of the volume and so this was unbalanced and when i, to and when michael, I told it michael can you tell people who leo trepp was i'm not sure they know who yeah he was. leo trepp uh is um the last um um landesrabbiner uh who uh worked in germany and uh the last landesrabbiner who um, worked until uh, the so-called Reichskristallnacht. Then he uh, was deported to uh, a concentration camp, but he uh, could uh, go to England. From there, he went to America and he worked at Napa College uh, as a professor for decades. And since the 1970s, he came back every summer term to Germany and he uh, taught uh, Jewish studies in Germany. And he was uh, such an mm, uh, impressive person that it was really not only learning, but learning. It was learning in the best sense of the word. And, and well, and, and, and Leo Trepp, he wrote about uh, Jewish philosophy. In fact, he, he did his doctorate in, on philosophy in, in Germany. And uh, well, and these were, were my, my, my teachers. Well, and, and then I, I told Professor Meyer, well, what we have done is quite unbalanced. Well, this was a bad decision because he started throwing books at me. <laughs> he missed me, he missed me. But, but uh, some days later we argued again and again and I said, well, maybe sometimes he didn't want to hear that. And in 2012, after some years at Landau University, I went to Tübingen University, came to Tübingen in 2012 as a professor. And, uh, and uh, I was uh, uh, leading the Institut für Antikes Judentum und Hellenistische Religionsgeschichte, Institute for Ancient Judaism and Hellenistic Religions, uh, formerly run by uh, Martin Hengel. And uh, then I thought, well, now it's a Kairos. I want to do this again, but I want to represent all the diversity and all the pluriformity of Judaism in past and present. And this is, I know this is Mishuge, but, but I, I, I tried to, to do it as broad as I can. But do, planning this, meant looking into the mirror and uh, knowing, well, I know not this, I know this. So I need someone who knows another cis. Sorry, Bert. <laughs> and to, to make a start together. And well, I thought where to start. I'm from Germany and I wanted to uh, represent diversity and pluriformity, so it was a no-go to look for another German scholar. So I thought, well, it's best to look in, in Great Britain or in the US. And I did not want to work together 
with someone who thinks Judaism only as a system of symbols and, and things like that. No, it is a world religion and it should be seen as a living world religion. And I did not want to work together with someone who is um, in an only in a Haredi context. So it narrowed down to, excuse me, JTS. <laughs> So I went through our JTS and I landed with Bert Wisotsky. And at first we, we, it took some weeks. We Googled each other and looked, who is he? Who is Tilly? Who is Wisotsky? Can we work together? And after those weeks, we started planning. We started planning which to include, which not to include whom to ask, whom better not to ask. <laughs> and, and it took nearly a year until we had the blueprint of these three volumes and had all these wonderful colleagues who now wrote parts of these three volumes. So it went America, JTS, Bird. <laughs> three steps, but I was, I, I am so happy that uh, it worked out so well. So these are the two answers and please all excuse my bad, simple English and I hope it is sufficient. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael. And um, I, I will accept the compliment that you only got to me through the back door um, because uh, you, you came to the premier institution of Jewish scholarship, I think, in the world. And it's not coincidence that of our 30 authors, eight of us have a JTS affiliation, which is to say they, were got, uh, they got a degree here, they studied here, or are currently teaching here. I and one colleague are currently teaching here. Um, in the chat, someone asked about Israelis. Indeed, we have Israeli colleagues, and one is on the call, and we'll speak in a little bit. Um, and we wanted to achieve a balance. Balance is a very important thing. So the balance initially was between America, Europe, and Israel. And I have to confess, Jewish studies in Europe, to me, was a bit of a cipher. Um, I like many Americans, grew up believing that the two great um, central foci of American Judaism should be the Holocaust and Israel. But that meant Israel's alive and well, and Europe is long dead. And I am unbelievably happy to say that Europe is also alive and well, and that there is a great scholarship in Judaism throughout Europe. And many of the authors who we have in the volume I met for the first time as their editor, and that has been just a wonderful experience. Some of them are on the call today. Um, so I want to compliment JTS, but we have even non-JTS Americans. We have Europeans, and we have Israelis. When we initially put out our invitations, Michael and I were very, very careful to invite the, an equal number of men and women. Um, as it happens, and you probably all know this history, uh, through patriarchy, women came later to Jewish scholarship, um, not any fault of the women. Um, but one of the things the women have learned over the last two decades in particular is how to say no as well as yes, which means that ultimately the three volumes have about two thirds of the authors, about 20 of the authors are male and about 10 of the authors are female. Uh, but you'll hear from a couple of those authors today and like anything else, they will be able to speak quite well for themselves. Um, so I, I do want to compliment and say, um, we have here on the call, in addition to Michael Tilly and myself, um, Professor Phil Lieberman is here and um, we're gonna ask him to speak shortly. I don't know, I haven't seen him scrolling through the screen. Robert Chazen, are you on the call? If so, please unmute and say yes. Yes. Oh, there you are, wonderful. Here I am. Professor Chazen, how, how wonderful to see you. And I'm gonna call on you shortly too. Um, uh, 
Robert Chazen is a almost close neighbor um, downtown as opposed to uptown in New York. Uh, we have today, and I'm just delighted, literally on screen, it's the first time we're meeting each other, Professor Dahlia Marks from Jerusalem. Um, Jeffrey Herman is here, and he is tuning in from where he teaches in France. Um, Natalie Dorman from the exotic climes of Philadelphia. Um, Martin Kloka is here from Germany, and Gwen Kessler is here. Gwen lives also outside of Philadelphia, but she's traveling now. Oh, and last but not least, um, from England, uh, Rabbi Professor Norman Solomon. And um, let, me, let me just briefly say that I, I'm, I have invited five of the scholars to spend two minutes each um, telling us about their chapters and what they are trying to achieve in this volume. And I want to begin with uh, Professor Jeffrey Herman. Jeffrey, the floor is yours. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can okay. hear you. Okay, uh, great. It's, uh, it's, it's wonderful to be here. Thank you. Uh, uh, editors for uh, for a wonderful uh, a tremendous uh, job well done uh, my chapter is about uh, the Babylonian Jewish community uh, uh, in the Sasanian period essentially this is the community that created the Babylonian Talmud but I'm not I don't deal with Talmud I deal here with uh, social history with a uh, political history with a uh, describing the community and describing the Jews that uh, produced, uh, that lived in Babylonia in this time and created uh, uh, the Talmud. So I deal with, uh, with daily life. I talk about daily life, about uh, the relations with uh, the government, uh, agriculture, um, uh, the Jewish settlement pattern, also the rabbis and the schools and also uh, uh, a leadership institution called the Excel Arcade. I talk about uh, uh, relations, influences, um, exchange with uh, the Persian culture, with the Zoroastrian religion, and matters like that. Um, if there's one, uh, one, one topic that I can say that um, I thought was important to include in my chapter, that when I compare other similar chapters from the past, uh, um, they haven't included them. It is a, a, a page on the Babylonian legacy. By that I mean the ancient Babylonian uh, culture and religion that uh, came before, that the Jews became a part of, and then um, how it uh, impacted upon them. And uh, another, and a, if one can talk about um, a source, a major source that for me is far more important than has, than has been in other earlier chapters that were written a few decades ago on similar topics. It is the magic material that has come out of Babylonia. Uh, incantation bowls in the uh, hundreds or thousands have been discovered, are being deciphered and published. And um, um, earlier scholars would, would see magic and they would say, oh, this is, this, this is part of the influence of the Persians, of the Zoroastrians. And when one reads the content of these bowls, one can see that uh, the, it is the Babylonian uh, um, background that is there. Um, it's very much a Jewish thing, but it's, the background is Babylonian. We have Babylonian gods in there. We don't really have many Zoroastrian uh, deities mentioned in these bowls, but they do mention other things. And we have a lot of other things in there. But that was a, uh, one point that I uh, saw as important for me to, uh, to emphasize in, in my chapter. I want to thank you, uh, Professor Herman, because for me, as someone who studied the Talmud, and probably everybody on this call has read a little bit of Talmud, whether in English or in Hebrew or in Aramaic, um, it gave me the kind of background that I wish I'd had starting. And uh, the fact that you did include the magical material, which is there in the Talmud as well, I think gave us, and will give all the readers, a much rounder view of what Judaism was back then. Um, I also want to thank you for hewing fairly closely to your two-minute time limit, so I appreciate that. I now want to uh, turn to my colleague Gwen Kessler. Uh, Gwen wrote on 
feminism and gender in uh, Judaism, and she particularly uh, is focused in volume three of the three volumes, which is culture and modernity. Uh, Gwen, we'd love to hear from you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes, we can. Okay, great. So I wrote things, so I kept it uh, short. So first, I just want to say it is always a pleasure to work with my mentor, Bert Wazowski. His commitment to me and my work has been extraordinary, spanning now three decades. So thank you, Bert, for continuing to teach me and learn with me. Also, thanks to Michael Tilley. It is wonderful to get to see you and meet you today. So I'm grateful that I had the opportunity to write about Jewish feminism and gender studies for this article. What I try to do in this chapter is take readers through an intellectual interpretive history of Jewish feminist, gender, and a bit of queer and trans interpretations over the past 50 years, focusing on the 40 year period from the 1970s to the 2010s. This is material I teach regularly and material as well that informs the implicit and often the explicit foundations for my research and scholarship on rabbinics. As with all articles, it strives for an elusive balance between breadth and depth. There's much that I couldn't accomplish, but hopefully there is much there, there. Uh, it was a particular challenge and privilege to write about Jewish feminist interpretation at this moment in time, as Jewish studies, Judaism, and many Jews, and of course non-Jews, grapple with inclusion along cultural, ethnic, and racial expanses. So it was helpful for me to try to learn how to write about Jewish feminist interpretation in a way that includes Jews of all genders and gender identities, and to continue the work of acknowledging the voices of Jews of all races and cultures. That's it. Thank you, Gwen. Um, I, I, I want to say uh, that I have had the pleasure of working with Gwen, yeah, literally now for decades. And uh, we study together, but I, I want to say as firmly as I can that I think the, the balance has tilted Early on, you were my student and I was your teacher. And with this chapter, I think unquestionably, you have become my teacher and I'm grateful to be your student. Um, Gwen has absolute utter command of everything in, in gender studies and in feminist studies. And I think this chapter will be a landmark chapter for anyone who's interested in those fields. They'll have to start with Gwen and she is a wonderful guide to teach you uh, the ways of now four decades of scholarship. So thank you, uh, Professor Kessler. I now want to turn to um, Robert Chazen. Uh, I think I could not be more clear that there is simply no one alive who is more expert and more prolific on the Jewish Middle Ages. Um, if you want to know pretty much anything about the Middle Ages, particularly in Europe, um, you're going to read a book by Chazen. That's just the way it is. Um, and we are extraordinarily grateful that he was willing to write a chapter for us. And um, God willing, you will continue to write for many decades to come. But uh, your chapter is, again, a landmark of clarity, just plain and simple. Chazen lays out for us what the experience of the Jews were in the Middle Ages and their historic predicament. So, Professor Chazen, please. Many, many thanks. Uh, is my voice coming across okay? Very good. Um, there is a broad perception in Western civilization of the Middle Ages as a period of stagnation between the excitement of Greco-Roman antiquity and the revival of Greek and Roman culture uh, that is so central to modernity. Um, that's a very problematic view. In fact, there is a great deal that took place during the Middle Ages. Some aspects of society were relatively stable others changed enormously. And change is especially observable when we talk about Jewish life during the Middle Ages. 
the simplest way to put it is that during the course of the Middle Ages, more specifically, the second half of the Middle Ages, uh, the years from about 1000 to about 1500, a brand new segment of world Jewry emerged and developed, Northern European Jewry, in the year 1000, simply didn't exist. The Jewish population across Northern Europe was anywhere from nothing to minuscule. By the year 1500, there was a powerful Jewish presence. And just to take it down, Further, by the late 19th century, Northern European Jewry, often called Ashkenazic Jewry, had come to absolutely dominate worldwide Jewish population. Uh, why did this happen? It happened, uh, I want to emphasize, not because persecutions and not because of expulsions, it happened because a new sector of the war, of the West emerged with excitement, innovation, and opportunity, and Jews were attracted, first in small numbers, then in growing numbers, to this area of Northern Europe. The reception of these Jews was mixed. There were elements in the population that welcomed the new Jewish urban settlers. There were other segments of the population that resisted. Out of it all merged new styles of Jewish living, patterns of political life, patterns of economic activity, language patterns, cultural patterns, and religious patterns. Uh, it was a pleasure for me to have the opportunity to highlight these changes. I've written about them in different books, but within a collection of the magnitude of this collection and the diversity of this collection, to highlight the reality of a new segment of world Jewry, its patterns and its patterns was a very pleasant opportunity for me. And I thank professors Tilly and Visotsky for providing that opportunity. And I hope that set within the context of this wide ranging collection, the newness and difference of Northern European slash Ashkenazic Jewry will become uh, patent and more clearly recognized. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I think it's important to underscore what you said. For I suspect most of us on this call, it's hard to believe that there was a time that Judaism wasn't Ashkenazic. Yes. And you take us from really the moment of inception of Ashkenazi Jewry to its dominance. And it's, a, it's quite a marvelous and eye-opening journey, particularly the give and take between the Jewish community and the um, Christian rulers who, depending on the moment, either did or didn't tolerate their Jews. Um, I see many people in the chat are asking for a table of contents. I'm not going to read through all 30 chapters, but I, I do want to take a moment to show you. Um, these are what's called dummies. These are not the actual book, um, but volume one is on history. Volume two is on literature. And volume three is on culture and modernity. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that at the end, but there are still two more authors I want to call on to 
talk about their chapters. And the first of those two is coming to us from Jerusalem, in addition to writing an extraordinary chapter that basically surveys all up to modernity, all of Jewish liturgy, um, Jewish prayer, um, Dahlia Marx actually wrote her chapter in Hebrew, and I had the opportunity to translate it, which was a marvelous education for me, because while I am an expert at rabbinic Hebrew, I had to learn modern Hebrew in order to do it. So thank you, Dahlia, and we'd love to hear about your chapter now. Hello from Jerusalem. We actually had the first rain uh, today, so we had the Yore. Congratulate us. We really needed to cleanse a lot of dirt, so that's a very good news for us. As, a, as you said, Bert, I'm a liturgist, and that's what I try to write um, in, the, in, in this uh, essay. And for me, uh, liturgy is really what encapsulates everything. So you showed the three volumes, actually liturgy could appear in each one of them because it has to do with history, it has to do with literature, and it has to do with culture. So I don't know in which one of them <laughs> my essay will appear, but it actually could appear in each one of them. So as you know, many Jews were experts on, um, many Jews studied the Maimonides, many Jews studied the Talmud, many Jews studied Halakha, Musa, Hasidism, Kabbalah. But the one book that Jews came across with, all Jews, well, especially Jewish men, Jewish women is a slightly different story, is the Siddur, is the prayer book, right? And of course, when I say the Siddur, it's completely, um, it's a mistake, you know, there is no the Siddur, that's what I try to show uh, in my chapter, to show the diversity, to show the plurality uh, in the involvement of uh, Jewish liturgy, that's what I try to do now, there is actually not too many Jewish liturgists. I think Christians are much, doing much better than us in that field. I always try to encourage my graduate students to, to write their uh, uh, dissertations on liturgy. Uh, I think it's very important to pursue this. You know, the seminal book on the field is by uh, Elbogen, and it's more than 100 years old. And even the newest editions, at least in Hebrew, are all already 50 years old. So something new has to be written. And in a way, uh, that's that's. I'm, I'm telling you a little secret. This is what this is my new project. And, and in a way, the chapter I wrote for this book, uh, Bert, is in a way the, the blueprints for for the book that I'm working on. And I just wanted to thank you, Bert, and thank you, Michael, for, for including me in this project. I think you showed a great generosity. When Bert uh, recruited me, I said I could write, but, uh, you know, I can't write in English now because it will take me three times more. And he said, oh, no problem, write in Hebrew, I'll translate it. Never heard of this kind of proposal before, but he actually did it. So thank you so much, and thank you, both of you, for creating this model of, of inclusion of Jewish scholarship in, the, in these three centers, North America, Europe, and Israel. I don't think it's too common, and I, I'm very, I'm gratefully, I, I want to gratefully acknowledge uh, this, and thank you for, for doing this for all of us. Chodesh Tov. Thank you, Professor Marx. Yes, um, it, it is uh, indeed, today is Rosh Chodesh, the beginning of the new month of Mar Cheshvan, the eighth month, and it is uh, appropriate. We just finished Sukkot, Shemini Yatzeret, and Simchat Torah, when we pray for rain. And um, not only has Dahlia written a potent chapter, but she is living proof that prayers occasionally work. So um, we're very happy for that. And uh, I know that Israel, as always, desperately needs the rain. So it's, it's good for um, everyone in the region. Uh, among the last of the authors I want to call on, is my, my colleague, Phil Lieberman. Um, Phil is trained as an economist, and that shows up in his writing of history. He particularly has written on Jews and or Jews under Islam. Phil, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, uh, Professor Vizotsky, and uh, also to Professor Tilly for the opportunity to write this chapter. Uh, Professor Vizotsky, I 
don't think that I realized what my chapter was about until I got your editorial comments and you wrote, I like your economic approach, but uh, because I'm an economic, social, legal historian, uh, in describing the transformation of the Jewish community from the period that Professor Herman spoke about, the Talmudic period, until that period that Professor Chasen spoke about, Jewish evil Christian Europe, right, what we have is some radical transformations from agrarian life in Babylonia to, in many cases, urban life, as well as continued agrarian pr production in uh, North Africa. So there's there are demographic questions, there are migratory questions, there are urbanization questions. And so that, you know, I, I guess I was really lucky that, uh, you know, as an economic historian, I could draw on, uh, you know, sort of my strong suit to describe these major transformations in the Jewish community, really from late antiquity to the Middle Ages, which would then lay the groundwork uh, for, uh, for the other chapters. So uh, it was a great pleasure to, uh, to be able to uh, sort of play to my strength. And, uh, I, you know, I hope that uh, the chapter, uh, you know, sort of adequately captures these, uh, you know, radical restructurings that the community experienced, uh, particularly with the engagement with the rise of Islam. Thank you. And of course, uh, just like Chazen and the rise of European Jewry that lived under Christianity, Phil writes uh, about how Jews lived under Islam and those two factors, how we live under Islam and Christianity have remained viable factors in Jewish life to this very day. Um, I want to very quickly also note, um, I wrote half a chapter on the literature of the Gaonim, that is to say, the rabbis who led the Jewish community in Babylonia, the land of Israel and North Africa, from around the year 600 to the year 1083. Um, Professor Tilly wrote on the literature of Hellenistic Jewry, which is to say literature that's largely preserved for us in Greek. Uh, Natalie Dorman, who's on the call, wrote about the Jews in the West, which is to say the broader Roman Byzantine Empire. Also on the call, Martin Ploca wrote about Zionism and the land of Israel. And last but not least, and it's where we ended our three volumes. Um, our colleague Norman Solomon wrote about uh, interfaith activities. Um, Norman is not only a scholar of interfaith activities, but he himself was intimately involved, quite literally, from the time of Vatican II to this very day. So as I said, we have extraordinary experts. Volume one is history, and it starts with the destruction, actually just a little bit before the destruction of Jerusalem. And so volume one takes us from the transition from Israelite cultic Judaism, what we find in the Torah, to rabbinic Judaism, which is what we still live today. And it goes quite literally through all the centuries. The final chapter of volume one is actually Judaism in Europe after World War II. So it's a comprehensive volume of Jewish history. Volume two is on Jewish literature, and that includes everything from, as Dahlia said, the Sidur, um, uh, Michael Tilly uh, on Hellenistic, I wrote on Gaonic, my colleague in the same chapter wrote on the literature of the Karaites, my colleague here at JTS, Jonathan Milgram, wrote about medieval commentaries and responsa, my student and colleague Rachel Mikva on Biblical, medieval biblical commentary. We have a chapter on Piyut and um, a chapter on Jewish mysticism. So uh, that's volume two. And then volume three, uh, which you can immediately, I, I hope you're all going onto Amazon buying even as we speak. Um, Jewish engagement with modern culture, modern halakha. Um, that chapter is written by my teacher, my colleague, Elliot Dorf at the American Jewish University. Elliot is the chair of the Conservative Movement's Committee on Jewish Law and Standards. So he's writing from an activist perspective on the languages of the Jews, Jewish philosophy and thought. Unlike that first volume, Michael, Jewish philosophy and thought only takes up 33 pages in this one. Modern Jewish literature, which goes all the way up to current living Jewish writers. You heard from Gwen, and I mentioned Norman Solomon's volume. 
and I, I dare say, uh, Tilly got it right. We spent a year back and forth, and I have all those emails, discussing how do we characterize Judaism. On one hand, when I was trained here at the Jewish Theological Seminary, there was still a very strong penchant for what Salo Wittemeyer Barone would call um, the lacrimose theory of Jewish history. The Jewish history was all about our tears, one, uh, as they say, one damn thing after another. Um, and we are, in part, in the history volume, seeking to dispel that. Obviously, there have been great tragedies in Jewish history, but there have also been huge areas of culture and wonderful things. And just as an example, in volume one on the history, my colleague at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, Lee Levine, is writing about the resilience of Jews and Judaism in late Roman Byzantine Eretz Yisrael. In virtually any other volume you read, you will read about the decline of the Jews in that period. And Lee, who is not only a historian, but an archeologist, can speak from the physical evidence to talk about the, the broadness of culture. Um, the other thing that Michael and I spent a lot of time wrestling with is that the greatness of the Jewish legacy is the literature that we've left. So we've dedicated an entire volume to the literature, to Jewish literature. By the way, while I'm talking, if you have questions, um, not just fetches about Amazon, but questions, um, put them into the chat so Professor Kramer can ask them on your behalf. And then, um, and I, I think this was Tilly's genius. He said, you know, literature is lovely, but there's something beyond literature. And as a European, he is a, clearly uh, captures understanding of that. And, and it, that is culture how culture and the mix of culture and modernity have created various Jewish communities at various times, but particularly now in the 20th and 21st century. So that third volume, I think, is also a standout volume for us because it sets us apart from most histories of the Jews or histories of the literature or descriptions of the literature. And um, there's just an incredible val value in reading the chapters that are there and reading people who are absolute culture mavens um, writing about culture. Uh, as I said, uh, Professor Tilly and I share a culture of single malt scotch. And I, I do wanna also say that he shares a culture that is completely alien to me. And it's not German Lutheranism. He's a fly fisherman and he can stand up to his knees in the water and fish all day long. That is not me. But um, despite that, we managed to bridge our differences. And, and I wanna be very, very clear. Um, so I'm, I'm reading a comment. Um, there is no German version of this book. And um, despite what you may read on Amazon or elsewhere, the editors at Kohlhammer made an extraordinary decision, which is that this German publisher would publish this book in Die Religionen der Menschheit, The Religions of Humanity, and all three volumes are only published in English. So you should have no hesitation. You're not gonna be reading German. You will be reading English. Some of the um, writers wrote in German, and there was a professional translator who translated. As I said, one of the writers wrote in Hebrew. I'm not a professional translator, but after I translated, Dahlia and I went over literally every line so that she was sure that uh, I could understand that. Um, that's the original first volume, right? Das Judentum, that Michael is holding up. But that's the old from, from a quarter of a century ago. Ours are all in English. Yes, Amazon does not entirely list it the way we wish they had listed it. Um, you know, one more problem with Amazon. What can we say? Um, but I, I'm sure that um, does volume two, well, I'll let David Kramer now um, turn to the questions. So I, I, I wanna be clear though, that this three fold division came as a result of a lot of two scholars of Judaism thinking hard about how do we best present Judaism at large? And um, in some ways it is still das Judentum, um, what we might call Judaica an academic thing. But I think, and I, I say this immodestly, but anyone who knows me knows that I don't generally do modesty. 
um, that we have captured something that is quite extraordinary. And I, I genuinely believe that three, these three volumes will be the go-to standard, whether it's Chazen's chapter or Dahlia's chapter on liturgy, that people will be reading these chapters um, for literally decades to come. For the next 50 years, that's what you want. Um, David, questions? Yes, okay. So uh, I'm, I'm going to begin. Uh, you noticed coming through the chat um, questions regarding the table of contents. You have masterfully orchestrated this so people, I think, have an excellent sense uh, of the range of scholarship and the chapters that constitute the volumes. But I wonder, is there a place such as the publisher's website uh, where the literal table of contents could be accessed? Do you or is the publisher on? They might know the answer to that question. Daniel, would you like to speak to that? Yes, good evening, everybody. Um, we will have the table of contents on our website, www.kohlhammer.de. Um, but it will, be, it will be online when all volumes um, have appeared. So for the time now, please do send me an email. I put my email address in the chat uh, and I will send you the table of contents of all three volumes tomorrow when I'm back at the office. Okay, very good. Thank you for that. So that's taking care of business. Um, I, I would ask those of you who um, you, you know, are, are writing in the chat now, please restrict yourselves to questions now so that it's easier for me to pick them out. Um, we have a question, uh, Bert, um, uh, the intended audience um, for these volumes. Um, what kind of setting is it likely to be used in? Who should, who do you imagine um, will be consulting it regularly? So from my perspective, and, and I'm going to also invite Professor Tilly to weigh in here. Um, from my perspective, this is not a volume for beginners. This is a volume for people who are either comfortable practicing Judaism or have studied Judaism, whether you are a Jewish studies major or you're ordained a rabbi. Um, uh, the point here is, is that this is a scholarly volume. It's not a beginner's volume. But if you are, I think, let's say a college junior or senior who might be a Jewish studies major, there will be articles that will be assigned. Uh, I also think it's the case that among the 30 chapters, there are different levels. So the chapter that's on the versions of the Bible, that is um, inside baseball. The uh, <laughs> chapter uh, that is Dahlia's chapter, for instance, or Chazen's chapter, I think even beginners can read that for the broad overview and gain an enormous amount. So um, I, I don't think we intended it to be something for everyone but we gave scholars enough latitude that there is. Michael? Yeah. Well, um, both of us, uh, Bert and me, okay, we maybe we are some smart cookies on our small field of expertise. And going through all these articles, I learned so many fascinating and new things. Things, everybody thinks, I knew before, but I know only after having read them in these articles. And I think this is kind of answer to this question. It is a book which needs a basic amount of expertise and a basic amount of, of um, interest in Judaism in past and present and all facets of, of, of Judaism. But it it uh, presents to experts so many new facets that it's really good for learning at every level. And, and, and this is, well, I'm the editor, but I, I, I learned so much from other contributors that I think this is one of the major benefits of our three volumes that it is good for someone who is studying, but it's also extremely useful for, for uh, academics. I, I, I want to underscore that as, as the co-editor, that to edit a book like this means that you're reading the experts in the field. And for me, 
I don't know that much. I mean, I know something about Judaism more than most because it's what I do, but I don't know that much that when I was editing, I had to do a lot of homework to read the authors because not only did I benefit from what was there, but I had to be able to discern what was not there and whether they should add things or not. So it, it was an enormous learning experience. I finally feel after 49 years at the Jewish Theological Seminary that I can say with some small degree of comfort, I know something about Judaism. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, a couple of listeners want to know, one listener wants to know whether there's a discussion um, of medieval Hebrew poetry, um, not liturgical, um, and another wants to know if there's a discussion of biblical criticism. So biblical criticism, particularly lower criticism, is there thoroughly. Um, higher criticism, less so. Hebrew medieval poetry, there's an entire chapter on piyut that includes both liturgical, which is also in Dahlia's chapter, and non-liturgical. Although, if I can crow for one of my colleagues here at JTS who did not write for this volume, um, the writing of Raymond Shinlin on medieval Hebrew poetry, particularly non-liturgical, but also liturgical, Ray has published volumes with Hebrew and English on facing pages with his learned commentary. And uh, it's an extraordinary education and joy. Okay. And then um, one other listener wants to know, is there a discussion of Josephus or Josephus' historical work? Yes. Um, my um, chapter on Jewish Hellenistic literature covers uh, Philo and Josephus too. And it covers uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls. Yes. Okay. And there um, are some pages on Josephus too. Good. Um, most of the questions have been about the contents. I actually I, I want to ask myself um, if, and this is a challenge, and I know it's hard to suggest this for a collected volume like this, but is there an overall thesis to the three volumes? So a, a, an idea about Judaism, its history, um, Judaism as a system, religious or otherwise, and so forth. Uh, even the question of whether Judaism is the right term to use for what's being described throughout these chapters. Michael, do you want to start? Um, I, I thought about and um, well, I read again Ben Sasson's uh, massive history and comparing our uh, history volume with Ben Sasson, I think what we are doing is much less teleological. And uh, it, what we do, and I think this covers all three volumes, is trying to, to picture this diversity and trying to picture this pluriformity and trying to picture uh, Judaism, which is, well, I'm not a Jew, but excuse me, this, this um, um, it's kind of holding, and inside of this holding are many, many, many different branches, which all belong to the same holding, but, but uh, can only be seen, especially from an outsider, as a multifaceted picture, and not as the Judaism. And I think this is one of, of uh, uh, please correct me, Bert, if I'm wrong. I think this is one of the specific aims that we try to show that there is a whole range of, of, of different fascinating outcomes of uh, Judaism in literature, in history, in, 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 in culture, in science, you name it. And and uh, this is an, a difference, for example, to Ben Sasson's massive yeah. work. I, I want to pick up on two words you said. One is pluriformity, that we present a rich um, complex of Judaism that does not easily fit, David, into a overarching thesis. There may be an arc of history, um, uh, in our editor's introduction, we start by talking about the phenomenon um, 
of 150 years ago, Wissenschaft des Judentums, academic study of Judaism. We talk about how World War II affected Jewish studies, um, etc. But we don't, I think, have an overarching thesis. The second word I want to um, focus on that Michael said, and I think it's right on point, is teleology. Um, if we read Ben Sasson's one volume, that very, very fat volume of Jewish history, Sasson leaves you with one very clear impression, and that is that all of Jewish history led to the founding of the State of Israel. And I think that if we were to characterize our volume, while we certainly give pride of place to the State of Israel, um, we are a diaspora history. We recognize that Judaism does not exist only in Israel, but exists and flourishes and has in Europe, in the Middle East, and now in North America and South yes. America as well. Yes. A world religion, that's what I said, yes. a world religion. Okay, wonderful. Um, I, you've, those of you who are still uh, listening, you've got uh, one minute to ask a final question um, via chat. If not, I will uh, uh, offer some concluding words. Um, so we've got a question here. Let me see. Um, no, it's actually not a question. A couple of nice comments. So it's nice to end with nice comments. I'll, I'll, I'll allow that to be the end of the chat. Um, and I want to say to uh, both of you and to the other contributors who were um, here to be able to describe briefly the chapters, um, speaking as someone who in my responsibilities as the director of the library of JTS, um, Bert, you say that, you know, after this many years, you finally feel like you know something about Judaism on account of having edited these volumes. I found that I had the same experience in having to take responsibility for um, a library who, who, that prides itself on the collection of Jewish works of all sorts from all centuries and so forth. So you and I uh, are on a common page uh, in that regard. Um, for those of you who've been listening, you should know that uh, Bert and I are now about I would say six feet from one another as the mouse burrows. Um, I am in my office on the sixth floor and he's only, you know, one office over below me on the fifth floor. Um, but it doesn't matter. We might as well be around the world. And it's so great that we've been able to bring all of you together. Um, a reminder that you can email the publisher um, if you want the table of contents now. If you're willing to wait, you can get table of contents in all the volumes at the publisher's website when that becomes available. And I can say that um, I can't wait to have all three volumes on my shelf so that as the questions arise about uh, elements of Jewish history and culture and the like, I've begun to dive into some of these chapters in the volume that you shared with me, Bert. And from that, I know that there will be that much more. I have to say, Bob Chazen, um, I can't wait to see um, your, you know, the, the, the summation um, of your views on uh, medieval Jewish history here. Uh, that will be a great treat and many, many others. So thank you all for joining us. Um, if you um, oh, I see my Just that you another want to make a short comment. thing. Yes? My, my university president told me I have to say that uh, the university with next many contributors to uh, JTS is Tübingen University with four contributors. Wonderful. And having Wonderful. Said this, I did everything for my university president. Thank okay. you. Okay, <laughs> Thank you good. all. That's great. And I just want to say, if I assume that all of you who have signed up for this um, are, you, you knew about it uh, on account of our announcements. We've got a very full schedule of book conversations, um, and we promise they will be as rich as this one. Um, and so if we don't have your email and you'd like to receive our notices, please let me know. Um, and thank you for joining us. And thank you, Bert and Michael, for uh, the marvelous, marvelous presentation and discussion. It was an honor. Okay. Bye-bye, Paul.